This episode of Gun Blog Variety Cast brought to you by LawofSelfDefense.com. Go to LawofSelfDefense.com forward slash variety to learn about your state's self-defense laws. Sign up for one of their online or in-person seminars or buy the book Law of Self-Defense and get 10% off when you use the discount code variety at checkout. That's LawofSelfDefense.com forward slash variety. Welcome to another episode of the Gun Blog Variety Cast with your hosts, Sean Sorrentino and Aaron Paulette. Welcome to episode 106 of the Gun Blog Variety Cast. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm doing pretty well, Sean. I am pleased to report that Operation Blazing Sword has successfully filed its nonprofit status with the state of Florida. And now we just need to get the federal government to approve it as a 501c3 tax deductible charity. And we're in business. Awesome. That's going to be really cool. I know. I've got such great hopes and dreams for it, and I hope they all work out the way I want. All right. Well, let's not belabor this too much because we got a big show. We got a whole bunch of things here. So a little housekeeping. I was on Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns, episode 108, and we talked mostly about the Society for Creative Anachronism, but there was some gun content at the end. And the reason I was on Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns is because Weird was on Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns, and they started talking about, whoa, Sean should come on and talk about the SCA. So Weird's episode was episode 106, so check out both of those. I'd like to know why I haven't been invited to any of these podcasts. Well, I'm not sure that you're geeky enough. Well, okay, so here's the thing, and I don't want to make this sound like I'm I'm picking on people, but I found out that I think it was Luke on Triangle Tactical just this past week or so was talking about Operation Blazing Sword, and that's great, that's fine, thank you for the boost, but um, I, you know, I'm I'm here, I can be invited to a podcast, dudes, invite me, I'll talk about it. <laughs> it's like you and Weird are being invited, and I'm not hard to find. Come on, guys, invite me. All right, so if you run a podcast and you'd like Aaron. Well, Aaron Paulette at gmail.com. Isn't it Aaron dot Paulette? Yes. Yes, it is. Aaron dot Paulette, P-A two L's, two T's? No, P-A-L-E-T-T-E. I'm your little pal, Paulette. So Aaron dot Paulette, P-A-L-E-T-T-E mm-hmm. at gmail.com. Yes, sir. She'll be on your podcast. So I happened to glance at the total dog walking mileage and Dysus and I are at 4,600 miles total. Wow. How far is that? I don't know if you've been paying attention to my little virtual walking tour of the United States. Uh, Of course I have. (laughs) At one point I decided, well, how far is it from here to say Huntington Beach, California, where I used to go, you know, boogie boarding out on the beach. Uh, So my virtual walking tour is from the Raleigh, North Carolina area to Huntington Beach, California, over the Golden Gate Bridge and all the way to Seattle to stop in and say hi to Barron. And I have started heading east from Seattle and I've made it as far as a little, I guess it looks like a one horse town in Montana called Galata or Galata. I, I want to say Galata. And let me say one more time that I love living in the future. I was able to pull up a Google Street View and Google Earth images of some random place in what looks really honestly the middle of nowhere. And if you're from Toole County, Montana, the Toole County, Montana Tourist Board or whatever you call yourselves, I think Aaron and I could be talked into visiting. I would love to visit Montana. Perhaps in a recreational vehicle. (laughs) I was looking at it, I was like, I'd like to see, that looks neat. In our first segment, Beth talks with author Liz Lazarus about her new book, Free of Malice. (laughs) 
I'm actually at the shooting range tonight because we had a wonderful event with our chapter of The Well-Armed Woman. We had our two-year anniversary, and here tonight we also had a very special guest who I was very excited to have with us. Her name is Liz Lazarus. She's from the Atlanta, Georgia area, and she is an author of a fantastic book that I think really every woman specifically should read, but also anyone who is a responsibly armed American should pick this up and give it a chance because it talks about some really important aspects. And Liz, I'm not going to take away all the fun, but I want you to be able to share a little bit of your creation and let the audience know what's going on and what they can expect when they crack open the pages of Free of Malice. So Free of Malice is a hypothetical legal story. It's based on a real event in my life, but it it is fiction. And the story is about a journalist who is attacked in her home. So in the book, she um, meets a lawyer, starts to work with him, and does this hypothetical legal case of what would have happened uh, had she actually shot and killed her assailant. What's really cool about this whole storyline is that we talked about this earlier too. A lot of people, when they have their concealed carry permit, maybe they've taken some classes, they kind of get this idea that, wow, I am like a superhero now. I have all these special powers and abilities and responsibilities, and I have this special shield and this protector. And if anything bad happens to me, I'm just going to chase down the bad guy and, you know, do what I have to do. Unfortunately, That's not always the case. We have to be really cautious and even more responsible when it comes to being a concealed carry firearm holder because we are held to basically a higher standard. Would you agree with that? Very much so. And actually, the inspiration for the book was, um, as I mentioned, a a real-life event. So when I was in college, I was living off campus in an area called Home Park. I was at um, Georgia Tech, and um, a guy broke into my house in the middle of the night and uh, tried to rape me. I was lucky. I was able to fight him off. Um, and really was was pure luck and me screaming and fighting back. And I think he eventually just realized he wasn't going to get his way. Yeah, you were too difficult of a target. I was too difficult of a target. <laughs> and I actually think he was targeting my housemate instead of me wow. and chose the wrong room. But after he ran away, I had said to my brother-in-law, who was a volunteer deputy, that I wished I'd owned a gun because I would have shot him instead of running to the door with, with my can of mace. And my brother-in-law said to me, well, lucky that you didn't, because that may not have been deemed self-defense. So that's what part of what sparked my mm. idea to write the book was what well, what would have happened had I shot the guy. Because back then, I, I was very ignorant about the laws of self-defense and where's the line between self-defense and vigilantism. I mean, you're basically telling all the, the, the reasons why I really am passionate about this book and why I really love it. Now, I'm an avid reader. I'm a writer. So I really appreciate a good story. And when I picked this book up, I, I didn't really know what to expect. I thought, how can you write a great book that's going to deal with firearms? This is, this is going to be interesting, you know, because we read all the things about skills and shooting and malfunctions. And, you know, there's not really anything fascinating and creative about that. But you have taken all those basics, really, and you've compacted that into a book that just tells this wild tale, this fantastic story. I felt for the, the main character. I really felt for her. And I wanted her to be successful. And I wanted her to be able to learn what she needed to learn. But you also threw some interesting twists in the book. Is, is that something you went into intentionally? I did. And that's probably what sparked me to write the book. There were a couple things. You know, what my brother-in-law said to me, um, because the attack was real, right. um, I actually started just journaling about how I felt. It changes to my life. I wrote about what happened that night um, of my own attack. So the original journal was the beginning of the book, mm. though I didn't realize it at the time. The thing my brother-in-law said sparked my curiosity about the legal case and the legal side of it. And then my mother asked me a question, which I won't give away the answer to, or the question because it um, gave me the idea for the twist ending. Once I decided that what the ending would be, I was like, okay, I, I have to write this book. It's, it's going to be, and it was fun to write. It was educational for me, even though I was a gun owner before I started writing uh, because the Laura character learns to shoot. Um, I spent more time at the range, more instruction time, and I realized that I needed more education. And again, that's exactly why I think that so many women are really going to love this story, kind of told from her perspective, learning the ropes, kind of learning from the get-go, really, not knowing really the basics of what to do with a firearm. But also, I think people are going to enjoy this book because it explores a lot of the nitty-gritty and the down-and-dirty aspects that would be involved with a legal case and with getting arrested. And with going through that whole process, I mean, it was very eye-opening to me. And this is something I actually teach my students. And I'm sitting there going, wow, this scenario is way worse than I've even expressed it to be. So it made me feel even more confident when I teach a concealed carry personal protection class to really hit home the idea that, look, if you have a gun, that is a wonderful tool that you have for self-protection, but you have to be cautious and you have to always follow the avoid, escape, defend rule in that order so that you don't make a mistake and actually cause a new crime to happen, basically. Mm -hmm. So 
What would be some of your thoughts or recommendations just talking to the audience about, you know, why should they get this book? Well, you know, I, I meant for it to be educational, which it is. Um, it is a classic whodunit. You've got a couple suspects in there, and I've had fun with some book clubs as they debate oh, yeah. who the bad guy is, right? And you find out at the end, but there's a bit of a twist. So I, I think you get some education. You get entertainment. Uh, if you know the Atlanta area, you also get right. um, some fun spots that I put in specifically because I love them. And also there's a theme song to the book. It was um, from a CD that I co-produced with one of my best friends from college, um, this, the same guy that I modeled the lawyer character after. So when you get to that part of the book where he takes the, the journalist Laura to Eddie's attic, you can hear the song. So you can either hear it with your QR reader in the book, or you can go to my website, freeofmalice.com, and hear the entire song on my website. Well, Liz, thank you so much for coming tonight and speaking to our group. And thank you also for writing a book that I think is really going to make a difference in our community and hopefully reach out to those who might not know a lot about firearms and help them become more confident in their journey. I know it's been a great read for me. I said that it was very much like reading a John Grisham novel. And I really felt like I was kind of diving right into one of the pieces that he may have produced with that kind of a style and that kind of an intrigue that really pulls you in. So So I hope that everybody out there listening has an opportunity to maybe check out Kindle. Is it on Amazon as well? It's on Amazon. It's on uh, Barnes & Noble. You can have the paperback or the Kindle version. I always joke you can't tell if your baby's ugly, but the reviews have been really good. And I've had people asking for my next book. So uh, I think my next book may have a Beth in it. Awesome. And that's what I'm really excited about to see the next book. Not because I might have a character named after (laughs) me, but because I think that Liz is a fantastic author. And like I said before, really making an impact in our industry. And that's about all that we have for you. I hope uh, the shooting in the background wasn't too distracting, but thanks for listening. And until next time, stay safe and be well armed. You can read more from Beth at usconcealedcarry.com forward slash blog and click on pacifiers and peacemakers in the left sidebar. This podcast runs on your donations. Go to gunblogvarietycast.com and click on the Donate or Subscribe button in the right sidebar. You can make a one-time donation of any amount or subscribe for as little as $2 a month. That doesn't sound like much, but we pay our server costs monthly. A little help from you is a big help to us. Felons behaving badly. So Aaron, have you heard about the horrific mass murder that happened in Greenville, North Carolina? Uh, what? Come on, it's got to have been all over the news. There was a mother and three children. They were all murdered, and the guy fled to Virginia, and they captured him, and they're bringing him back. They've they've just charged him. You've heard all about it. It's been all over the news, right? Because every time there's a mass shooting, it's all over the news. So, I mean, you should have heard about this one, right? I have not, no. So I wonder if there's a reason that it isn't being publicized nationally. The headline is, Cops, Army Vet and Her Three Young Daughters Were Killed With Hammer. Oh, so it's not a gun death, so it doesn't count. Because hammer deaths are good and wholesome. Pretty much. And we all know that blunt force murders happen more often than rifle murders, much less assault rifle murders. Dateline, Greenville, North Carolina. Police say a North Carolina man accused of killing his two young daughters, their sister, and their mother likely beat the victims to death with a hammer. News outlets report 39-year-old suspect was in a Richmond, Virginia courtroom Thursday for an extradition hearing on a murder charge in the death of 32-year-old Garlett Howard, a decorated Army vet. He waived his right to contest extradition and was expected to be back in North Carolina on Friday. Greenville police say they expect suspect will be charged with additional counts of murder in the death of the three children ages 6, 7, and 11. Police have said that the two youngest girls were suspect's daughters. The victims were found dead Tuesday night inside their Greenville home after suspects out-of-state relatives called Greenville police saying suspect had made concerning comments and they were worried about the welfare of Howard and the girls, according to CBS affiliate WNCT. Police say it's not clear when the four died. Suspect was arrested hours later in Richmond, Virginia, about 170 miles north of Greenville. He allegedly fled in a Chevrolet Equinox owned by Howard's employer, LabCorp. Police say autopsies show the four victims died from, quote, traumatic head injury by assault, unquote, and they believe suspect used a hammer. Greenville Police Chief Mark Holtzman said at the news conference Tuesday that police were aware of at least two previous incidents involving suspect and Howard, including a recent physical altercation and a suicide attempt by suspect in July. They reportedly say that the murders are domestic violence related. 
These four innocent victims were senselessly murdered at the hands of someone they loved, Holtzman said Wednesday, according to WNCT. As little girls, you should be able to trust your father, to look to him for advice, and know he will always be there to protect you. Suspect betrayed that trust. And as a result, these little girls and their mother paid the ultimate price. I, okay, I can understand wanting to kill your spouse. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying I can understand it. But, oh, my God, to kill your daughters, too? That's um, – I. this guy needs to be beaten to death with a hammer is what I'm saying. And so what kind of person do you figure pulls out a hammer and whacks his wife and his three daughters? I, I, I can't even joke. Just someone who needs to be beaten to death. That's all I got to say here. In North Carolina, he's been convicted of larceny, felon class H. Now, he has out-of-state relatives, so we don't know if he's always lived in North Carolina, but he has managed to rack up at least one felony in North Carolina. And they're reporting that there's at least two previous incidents between him and his wife. So he had a track record. This isn't some random concealed carrier going crazy and murdering somebody. This is a criminal. This is a waste of oxygen. Well, that too. So the wife was asking about those little key tracking tags she saw on the internets. But before I low jack my car keys, I want to get a professional opinion. Baron tells us about them in... Tech Tips. Tech Tips. Tech Tips. You are damaging my car. Tech Tips with the Baron. So Baron, my wife's seen these advertisements for something called Tracker Bravo. What in the heck is it? Well, Sean, have you ever misplaced something like your keys and had trouble finding them? Tracker aims to help with this problem by giving you something that you can pair with your phone to help you find the missing item. Well, how does that work? The basic premise is the little Tracker R device connects via Bluetooth Low Energy, and an app running on the phone communicates with the device, allowing you to cause it to chime or buzz, even if it disconnects. Putting one in your wallet can let you know that you left your phone somewhere. Where it goes one step further, though, is using the power of crowdsourcing to find the missing object. Crowdsourcing the solution? How does that work? Let's use a hypothetical. You're at the beach, and your keys fall out of your pocket as you're walking to or from your car. Depending on the distance, that can be a lot of ground to search, especially in soft sand that could have easily buried the keys. What Tracker does, though, is anyone who has the app installed is constantly watching for Tracker beacons. When their phone sees one, it tells the cloud, hey, I saw some serial number at GPS coordinates blah de blah at some particular time. This way, you can always see the last known position your items were seen at. This gives you a starting point. The BLE radio only gives you maybe 30 meters in perfect conditions. 30 or 60 feet is way more accurate. What happens, though, is once you get in range, it can use your movement coupled with changes in signal strength to help you triangulate the position of the device. Additionally, you can make it start making a noise so you can use your ears to help find it. Well, that seems pretty useful. So what's the catch? There's two real catches. One... The power of crowdsourcing is dependent entirely on the popularity of the region you're in. For example, say you're backpacking and drop something. Unless it's frequented by other tracker users, that's not going to help you find the starting point. Along with that, I don't know how they handle position reporting when you're outside of data coverage as well. If the app caches the information and then pushes an update later when you have service again, that would be much more useful than the alternative of no data and no one can ever say they found something. Ever. The other is the fact that you're somewhat lowjacking yourself. I've talked about this previously with regards to tire pressure sensors. Each one of these devices has a unique serial number because anyone with a phone needs to be able to query the serial number to find the missing device. It's technically out in the open. While I wouldn't worry as much about somebody actually leveraging Tracker's database to find someone, it could be used by someone who, say, scattered a bunch of devices around that were watching for trackers going by. Each time it saw one, they could update their own server. The thing is, this would be very targeted, and if you were subject to the issue, well, they would be monitoring you a bazillion of other ways too. So, as long as their data stream to the cloud remains secure, the privacy issue, while there, I would say is low to mid-level. While sitting here, I realized you could use it to tell if someone was gone. At the same time though, I could use your phone Wi-Fi or BLE to tell that same information as well. So it's not really a new vector, it's just another take on the same old stuff. So do you think they're really worth it? Disclosure, I have not personally used one, so take everything I've said above and here as you wish. Depending on what you're putting it on and where you live, it could definitely be handy. I know the flight test guys put one in their quadcopter and used it to locate it after a crash. 
But again, it's the whole, will people be going by the area and give you a starting point, or do you have to know the starting point already? Some of the more neat items I've seen, though, is embedding them in bikes to locate them after they're stolen. Again, it only is going to really give you a last known location, so it may or may not really help. For general things like keys, wallet, and you forgot your phone reminders, though, it can be handy. And for those going, how can you forget your phone? You may not have forgotten it. Maybe you slipped it in your pocket, but it didn't fully go in and then fell out as you walked away. (laughs) Or ended up in the couch and I can't figure out where. That's exactly right. Well, thanks for the tips, Baron, and I'll see you next week. See you next week, Sean. Baron still blogs at the-minuteman.org. And now a word from our sponsor. You know what will happen. If you ever have to defend yourself, you're going to end up in handcuffs. Are you trained to win the fight after the fight? Sure, you can draw, aim, and put two in the ten ring, but have you learned your legal self-defense? Do you know the law? Go to lawofselfdefense.com forward slash variety to sign up for your legal self-defense class. Each class is tailored to the laws in your state. Attorney Andrew Branca will teach you the law, not just what the law says, but what the judge's legal opinions say, what the jury instructions say. Sure, you could risk spending the rest of your life in prison because you followed the advice of some gun store counter jockey, or you could spend the day with the man who literally wrote the book on the law of self-defense. Carry a gun so you're hard to kill. Know the law so you're hard to convict. Go to lawofselfdefense.com forward slash variety to sign up for a legal self-defense class in your state. And make sure to use discount code variety at checkout to receive 10% off. Tiffany is on assignment and will return next week. Tiffany did call me from her desk at U of Memphis where she's buried under some mounds of paperwork and asked me to specifically to give a quote, public shout out, unquote, to Charles, a listener who took the time to disagree with Tiffany about Trump's Second Amendment people statement from her segment back in episode 104. Tiffany said, I am glad that he started a dialogue and did so in a respectful and civil manner. And I'm glad he engaged me with actual objective evidence rather than just spouting unsupported emotional outbursts or deflecting to all the unrelated flaws of other candidates. So kudos to him and my sincere thanks. So thanks, Charles. So in random minor presidential campaign news, did you hear that Dr. Jill Stein, MD, called nuclear power plants WMDs? I did, Sean, and that pegged my BS detector. And so, you know, don't worry about this. I've actually got this segment. So I've wrested control of the main topic away from Sean today because I want to address a series of tweets that have been going around by a Green Party candidate, Jill Stein. Her first tweet that we're talking about was on the 30th of March, where she said, nuclear power plants equal weapons of mass destruction waiting to be detonated. Time to shut them down. Hashtag end nukes. Her second tweet on this topic was on the 14th of August, where she says, Don't think that nuclear power plants are WMDs waiting to be detonated. Anti-terrorism authorities disagree. Now, I'm not a nuclear scientist, but even I know that her claims about nuclear power plants exploding like a bomb are wrong. But I'm not entirely sure how I could explain that. Fortunately, I happen to know someone who works in the nuclear field. So, please welcome to the show a listener to the Gunblog Variety Cast, uh, Mr. Robert Paul. Now, Robert, I understand you are a nuclear professional. Yes, Aaron, I am. I've worked in the nuclear field for just about eight or nine years now. So, Robert, uh, let us unpack these claims by Dr. Stein. We'll do the second one first about how anti-terrorism authorities believe that uh, nuclear power plants are at risk. Can you address that? I believe the way nuclear power plants are at risk are not because of a, of a prompt chain reaction like you'd get with a nuclear explosion, but more so because of the fuel that they contain. If, if a terrorist wanted to do damage to a nuclear power plant, they would they would try to cause a radiological release rather than an explosion. And that's why nuclear power plants are so heavily protected the way they are. And I know that you don't want to get into specifics, but 
We do know that nuclear power plants are highly protected. Uh, here's what I know, and you can tell me I'm right, tell me I'm wrong, chime in as you wish. The uh, cyber facilities in a nuclear power plant are both hardened and air-gapped from the internet, and the physical facilities are staffed by former military personnel, many of them military police, who have access to M4s and strict instructions to shoot to kill anyone beyond the perimeter. Is that correct? That is correct. So now that we've demolished the second of her tweets, let's go back to that first one where she claims that nuclear power plants are WMDs just waiting to explode. Now again, I don't even pretend to be knowledgeable in exactly how nuclear power plants work. What I have is a rough working knowledge and essentially, you have a nuclear material which is quite physically hot because it is decaying. And as this material uh, releases the heat, these power plants pipe water into it, which is then converted to steam, which turns turbines. Essentially, a nuclear power plant is a highly complex and glorified steam engine. Is that correct? That is correct. They are there are several different types of of nuclear reactors, but largely what you said is is correct. That's that's how they that's how they function. Some of them boil water inside the reactor, and some of them boil water in in a vessel called a steam generator, which is separate from the from the reactor. It just depends on the the technology. But at the core, pun intended, it is a it's nuclear fuel that's heating water. You did mention earlier the release of. Actually, what was it you said? I called it a radiological release. There's three levels of containment at a nuclear plant. And in order for radiological material, either in the form of contamination or radioactivity itself, to uh, endanger the public, get into the environment, you would have to have breached all three of those levels. Let, let's back up a little bit and talk about the difference between a nuclear uh, weapon and, 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 and the nuclear reactor that, that generates steam for the purpose of commercial nuclear power. The difference is in the fuel. The fuel that is used in a weapon is enriched to greater than 85% of your uh, uranium-235 content, where the fuel used for a nuclear uh, power reactor is enriched to uh, less than 40, typically less than, it's between 4% and 40%. In a nuclear explosion, you have a quick and uncontrolled chain reaction. In the generation of nuclear power, we have a extremely controlled and slow chain reaction. We take a reactor critical, which means that it's able to the chain reaction is able to sustain itself, and we use water and other materials to moderate that chain reaction so that it, it's sustained over a period of months or years, depending on the length of the fuel cycle. The difference between a nuclear explosion being prompt critical and a, a nuclear power plant going critical and staying there over a period of time is in the fuel itself. The fuel used in a nuclear power plant cannot create that chain reaction that is needed, that the uncontrolled prompt chain reaction that is needed for a nuclear explosion. So there's just no possible way that a nuclear power plant is going to explode like a nuclear weapon or a weapon of mass destruction. Okay, that's great to know. But what is a meltdown? A meltdown is where we've lost control of the process. Typically what happens in a meltdown is that the water that we're using to cool the core, because we have to maintain uh, the core at a certain temperature as part of the chain reaction that the, crit the criticality of, of the reactor. When the core is uncovered, meaning that we boiled off that water because we're not able to cool it, then what will happen is the fuel will get so hot that it will melt the reactor vessel that it's sitting in and possibly, in theory, will melt its way all the way through the earth. And therefore, you get the term the China syndrome. Can you explain that for people who don't know the term? So that means that the fuel is so hot that it has melted its way through the reactor vessel. It's no longer contained within the vessel, and it's melted its way through all the layers of the earth, through the core of the earth, because of this now uncontrolled uh, chain reaction that we're not able to control through the use of cooling and moderating materials. And therefore, it will melt a hole, burn a hole, all the way through the earth and come out on the other side in China. 
there, the China syndrome. It can't really make it all the way to the other side. I mean, surely gravity would stop it at the core. I preface that comment with theoretically. Okay. So a meltdown, I imagine, could result in a re release of nuclear material because that's what happened at Chernobyl, correct? It is what happened at Chernobyl, and it was what happened also at Fukushima. All right. Now, I understand that these sorts of events are highly rare because there is a system in all nuclear power plants. What they consider to be a risk is what some of us would consider a minor inconvenience, like there is a fuse being out or the number three alert light doesn't light up. So I do understand that nuclear plants have a excessively anal retental approach to security. Still, there is the possibility, however minor, that there could be a release of nuclear material, such as with Chernobyl or Fukushima. So, since you were also a prepper, this is a very natural segue into how would someone prepare for a nuclear emergency if they live within the area of a nuclear power plant, and how would they bug out for that? In my opinion... The best way to prepare for a nuclear emergency is to understand just how far away from the plant, the nuclear plant, you, you live. Uh, they have two exclusion zones that are defined by the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and those exclusion zones are at, at 10 miles and 50 miles. If you are within 10 miles of a nuclear power plant, you're susceptible to, uh, if there were a radiological release, you could be susceptible to what we call a plume, which is a a plume of, of radioactivity that is uh, directed by the wind. And so depending on which way the wind blows, that 10-mile uh, exclusion zone is actually a 10-mile circumference around the nuclear power plant. So depending which way the wind blows will determine exactly how much uh, radioactivity that you might experience. I run into people all the time that don't realize there's a nuclear power plant within 20 minutes of their house. And so it's always good to know what the hazards are, identify them so that you can prepare for them. I mean, that's the, to me, that's the fundamental rule of, of prepping is understanding what the risk is and preparing for it. So if you live within a 10 mile exclusion zone of a nuclear power plant, you are able to get a hold of a product called potassium iodide, which is K or referred to as KI, which is uh, something that will protect your thyroid in the event of a radiological release. Myself, I would prefer, if I were in the path of a plume, I would prefer to leave rather than try to hunker down. A couple of things are going to happen. Typically, at a nuclear power plant, when there is some sort of a, uh, an emergency like that, it's not going to go from everything is fine to general area emergency, which is evacuation for the surrounding populace. That means that we have lost control of the chain reaction and we are heading towards the imminent meltdown. That's not happened anywhere in the United States. The closest that we got was Three Mile Island back in 1978, but we were able to, uh, because of the built-in safeguards and safety systems that we have in nuclear power plants, we were able to prevent that from happening. And one thing the nuclear industry does is they learn from their mistakes. And so we've enhanced our, our methods and our redundancy, our safety system redundancy to prevent that from happening again. But let's assume for a second that something like that was to happen. You'll start hearing the official channels broadcasting that there are, because there's four different levels of, of alert at a nuclear power plant. It starts off with a notification of unusual event which is something you probably w wouldn't hear about through the official channels. That is where the um, site emergency personnel basically man their stations to start managing the event for what it is. The next level is what we call an alert. Could be a fire that lasts more than 15 minutes in a, in a piece of equipment, a non-safety related piece of equipment somewhere on site. Okay, so then the next level is the site area emergency. This is where we start evacuating all the non-essential plant personnel because the uh, events that were already in progress that have already been declared as either a notice of an unusual event or an alert have progressed further and are now threatening the radiological safety of the plant itself. The level beyond that 
is a general emergency. This is where it's over. We've lost control of the event that we were having, and we are now preparing to evacuate the community. So knowing that these four levels exist, once the official channels start broadcasting the site area emergency, which they will broadcast that to the population, in my opinion, it's time to leave. If you can pack up what you need, your pets, your children, anything that you can get in your vehicle and travel to further than 50 miles away from that nuclear power plant, that's my recommendation at that time. If you plan to stay and, and you don't plan to leave, there's, there's two possibilities. You're either going to be asked to um, shelter in place, seal off all your windows and doors, and not go outside until you're notified by the official channels to do so. Or you're going to be asked to evacuate depending on wind direction and, and, and where the plume is at that point. At this, at this time, plan on not coming back to your, to your home. Oh, wow. It's really that bad, huh? That would be the worst case scenario. And I imagine you wouldn't come back because everything would be irradiated. That's correct. We would be in the same situation that Fukushima and Chernobyl are now. All right. So if you're going to evacuate, you have mentioned that people need to evacuate to a minimum distance of 50 miles, right? Yes. Now, what if for whatever reason you cannot evacuate and you need to bug in? It seems like a lot of the procedures are similar to protecting your house from a chemical or biological attack. Yes, they're very similar. You're going to want to make sure that you remain inside until you're told it's safe to go outside by the officials. You want to ensure that all your windows and doors are closed. Turn off all fans, air conditioners, and any other equipment that introduces outside air to the inside. Go to the basement if you have one. If not, then stay on the lowest floor and towards the middle of the structure. Choose a room without windows and, and windows or outside doors if possible. And be prepared to leave as soon as you're told it's safe to do so. Now, what about taking plastic and duct tape and taping over all the seams to doors and windows and vent fans leading from the outside to the inside of the house? That's absolutely recommended. At this point, you're trying to not so much stop the threat of radi radioactivity, but you're actually trying to prevent the intrusion of contaminated material. Okay, so it's not just closing the windows and the doors, it's sealing them off. Yes, and that's why you want to make sure that your fans or any, any device that's going to be introducing outside air is uh, secured as well. This actually is a nice callback to a series of posts that I've already done on blue collar prepping about radiation and its effects. I do talk about decontamination. I do talk about the hazards of inhaling radioactive particles. And because you mentioned it, I do talk about in greater detail what potassium iodide is and how it works. So I'm going to have the links to that listed in the show notes. So I think that brings us full circle, Robert. Thank you very much for your time. You've been a great guest, and I hope to have you back again. Thank you very much for having me. I'm glad to do it. And anytime, Aaron, anytime at all. Not only can you subscribe or donate to the podcast, you can also make a contribution to the LGBT Training Ammo Fund. Go to gunblogvarietycast.com and click on the LGBT Training Ammo Fund donation button in the right sidebar. I'll use this money to pay for range fees, targets, and yes, ammo for the people I teach. And thanks for your support. What happens when an anti-gun radio host invites two anti-gun activists to gang up on the leader of the U.S. Concealed Carry Association and totally ignore the regional director of students for concealed carry? Well, you call it NPR. Weird feels you should get your tax money's worth out of it in This, this Week, week in, in Anti-Gun anti -gun Nuttery. Nuttery. So hey, Weird, what do you got for me this week? So this week, I discovered an NPR episode focusing on right to carry. The host was Diane Rehm, and the guests were Evan Osnos of The New Yorker, John Donahue, an anti-gun researcher from Stanford, Tim Schmidt of the U.S. Concealed Carry Association, and Antonio Okafer of Students for Concealed Carry. Now for starters, this is anti-gun nuttery, so I won't be quoting Tim Schmidt, but I will say he does a great job. Nor will I be quoting Antonia, because she was only given a brief introduction and then completely excluded from the show. 
The show is deeply biased as Miss Okafer wasn't given any time at all, and every statement Mr. Schmidt made was allowed to be rebutted by one or both of the anti-gun panelists, and conflicting information was simply left for the audience to pick a side. So they lead off talking about the Gerald Ung case, and they really show their colors from the start. First, Evan Osnos. Gerald Ung was charged with attempted murder and was, uh, was exonerated. He was, in the view of the jury, uh, and it was a jury trial, uh, he had been acting in self-defense. And the key point, the, the sort of central detail of the case was that at one point during the case, at one point during the confrontation, I should say, one of the people on Eddie DiDonato's side had said, I'm going to kill you. It was in the course of sort of shouting and, and screaming on the street corner. And that sentence became very important in its own way because it was interpreted uh, as a reason why Gerald Ung might have a reasonable fear for his life. And then John Donahue. The folks who are skeptical about right to carry say uh, you have this severely injured person that uh, without guns, maybe the, somebody would have gotten a bloody nose. I wasn't familiar with this case, but Pennsylvania resident Sebastian covered it extensively in the Shall Not Be Questioned blog, which I have linked in the show notes. And Sebastian strongly believes that the jury acted correctly in acquitting Mr. Ung, given that he was attacked by several large drunk men vocally threatening to kill him. Ung had also been drinking that night, but there was a security camera that caught the incident, as well as multiple witnesses. As you know, Sean, Pennsylvania does not have any specific law against carrying while drinking. Of course, Donahue, like many anti-gun nuts, is very flip about street fights, and his throwaway line completely ignores that this street fight would have been five large men attacking a small Asian man. These incidents happen all the time, and the smaller outnumbered person often ends up just as dead or maimed as a victim of a gunshot wound. I have to finish this section with Mr. Osnos winning the No Shit Sherlock Award when asked why Mr. Ung was legally armed that night. In the case, Gerald Ung explained that he had been worried about street crime. Well, go figure. He was concerned about street crime, and he was assaulted by multiple attackers on the street for the express purpose of murdering him. Oh, those paranoid gun nuts thinking you need to carry those evil little guns. So now Donahue talks about his research. The job for a researcher like myself is to try to tease out from the statistical evidence whether, on balance, they are more damaging uh, or more helpful. I think you know where this is going. First, he's asked about mass shootings and concealed carry preventing them. The, the FBI has actually done a, a fairly good investigation of this question. They looked at 160 incidents of uh, active shooter uh, uh, cases. And uh, in, in the 160 cases they looked at, um, about 25 percent were stopped by police, uh, but none were stopped by what I would consider a, uh, a civilian with a right to carry permit. Did he even read the report? There was one confirmed case in that report where a man with a valid concealed carry permit stopped a spree killer. I also have in the show notes a very extensive list of civilians with concealed carry permits who have stopped a spree shooter. We can argue that maybe some of those incidents don't count for one reason or another, but could Mr. Donahue disprove all of them? Furthermore, the FBI lists out every individual attack they cite, and I went through all 160 of them. Of those 160, I could positively confirm that 72 of them effectively banned concealed carry in the location of the shooting. That's 45% of all the shootings cited. Additionally, another 20 cases happen in states that are very restrictive about who's issued permits. So while it's possible that somebody with a valid concealed carry permit could have been there legally, the chances are very unlikely. So with those counted, it now covers 57% of the listed shootings. Also, 44, that's 27.5%, were private businesses where concealed carry is legal, but carrying by employees might be grounds for termination. Some of these businesses I confirmed employee policies or was aware of binding signage that legally banned carry. But some places like Walmart and Target retail stores where employees may be banned from carry, but this doesn't include customers who are likely present. So it isn't 84% of all shootings, but there is some overlap. I also must note that 21 attacks, 13%, were stopped when an unarmed citizen stopped the attacker. And evidence clearly shows that fighting back gives victims a vastly better chance than hiding or playing dead. So the idea of not giving potential victims the best tools for defense seems quite foolish. Now onto his pivotal Stanford anti-gun piece that he constantly references throughout this interview. 
If you compare uh, violent crime in the 10 states that have not adopted right-to-carry laws over the period from 1977 to 2012, they experienced a 38% drop in violent crime. If you look at the 36 states that did adopt right-to-carry laws over that time, virtually no change in their violent crime rate. So there has been a very benign movement in violent crime in the United States, but it's been restricted to those states that have not adopted right to carry. I wasn't able to see his data, nor do I think anybody was, as John Lott asked to see the data as well, as it directly refutes his famous More Guns, Less Crime study, and Dr. Lott was stonewalled. Still, I found the most telling piece of information in an interview with Dr. Donahue done by his own university. I quote, Different statistical models can yield different estimated effects, and our ability to ascertain the best model is imperfect. I simply read that as, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. Dr. Donahue is also the author of the highly controversial study that claims the legalization of abortion reduced violent crime. That was made famous in the book Freakonomics by Stephen Dovner and Stephen Levitt. So Dr. Donahue is no stranger to tenuous studies that carry the water for progressive politics. When his bogus stats were challenged by Mr. Schmidt, he says this. You know, that's a a very misleading statistic, because if you're comparing, you know, South Dakota to uh, California or New York, of course, South Dakota has a a, a lower crime rate. It's a it's a rural state, uh, but it had a lower crime rate before it passed right to carry laws. The question is, what happens to crime after the right to carry law gets passed? Well, states like California continue to have violent crime. Anti-gun states like Hawaii and Massachusetts that have relatively low violent crime still have low violent crime, even when they increase restrictions, though other data points to smaller increases. And lastly, rural states with very friendly gun laws see changes in violent crime at the statistical noise levels. Dr. Donahue doesn't want to make the comparison because it exposes him for the fraud that he is. Really, it shows us very clearly that violent crime has nothing to do with guns or gun laws. Instead, it has everything to do with large urban centers with established gang activity. Be it Houston, Boston, L.A., or New Orleans, if your big city has lots of gangs, it has lots of violent crime. And rural areas have virtually no violent crime at all. And then there's this whopper. If you want to do something to reduce crime, uh, you know, support universal background checks. There is some evidence that mass shootings are quite a bit lower in the states that have universal background checks. What? First up, most states don't have a universal background check law, and most states haven't experienced a mass shooting at all. Also, California and Illinois have had multiple mass shootings in recent years and have universal background checks. And of course, there's the Umpqua Community College shooting in Oregon that happened directly on the heels of the state passing a universal background check law. It's all moot anyway, as the vast majority of spree killers don't have a criminal background and buy their guns legally. This is just partisan crap. And most likely it was made up on the spot. In one of his segments, Mr. Osnos claims that simply buying a gun puts you in great jeopardy of grave bodily harm. Tim Schmidt correctly identifies this as Arthur Kellerman's heavily refuted study that we have talked about at length on this show. And he gives one of the many methodological errors Dr. Kellerman used to paint guns as a menace. Instead of directly responding, Osnos dumps it in Dr. Donahue's lap. I'll let John Donahue fill us in on the statistics that have been been vetted by the science in this case. Interesting retreat. But then Dr. Donahue was never asked to take a stand on the Kellerman study. It was just left in limbo for people to decide for themselves who's right. So I'll close with a little statement by Evan Osnos that I think is really telling, but probably not in the way he meant it. We are um, experiencing a debate in which two sides are operating with almost completely disconnected sets of facts and experiences. And and you can go about your day fortifying your own belief. And I actually, and this is a genuine uh, compliment to Tim Schmidt for coming on today to talk about this, because this is a chance to actually have multiple communities talking to each other in ways that don't happen all the time. And, you know, I was grateful to him that he spoke to me for this story. And I think that one of the things that we're confronting if we want to actually deal with the problem of gun violence. And I think we all agree that the number of people dying by gunfire every year is unacceptable. If we want to deal with that, we have to start having conversations in which we agree on some of the basic facts and realities. 
Except this wasn't a debate or even a discussion. It was an anti-gun host with two anti-gun guests ganging up on a single pro-gun person. The second pro-gun guest must have just been on to make the dais appear more balanced because she was only addressed by the host and given the briefest of airtime. There was virtually no opportunity for Tim Schmidt to challenge the anti-gun points that appeared to refute his. And when the facts were challenged, the disparity was never settled. So while I applaud Tim Schmidt and Antonia Okafer for appearing on what they had to have known was a hostile show, their efforts were really wasted, as anti-gun listeners really weren't challenged, nor were pro-gun listeners. The same goes for this segment here. I really don't expect to be directly converting anti-gun people in this segment. If you're listening to me now, you likely agree with me. What I'm doing here is giving you the talking points of the other side and the arguments to counter them. While the anti-gunners don't listen to pro-gun podcasts, they will listen to you. So pay attention and read those show notes. All right, Weird. It was good to talk with you. I'll see you again next week. See you next week, Sean. In addition to appearing here, Weird is a regular host on The Squirrel Report and blogs at weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. This week's Plug of the Week is a special interview with Paul Lathrop of Polite Society Podcast. Paul was involved in a defense of gun use about six months ago. Paul gave a full interview on Bob Main's Handgun World Podcast, so we're not going to repeat the whole thing here. But I am going to ask Paul to tell us about the two things he would have liked to have done differently. Paul Lathrop is the executive producer and host of the Polite Society Podcast as well as the co-founder of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks for having me, Sean. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Now, I just got finished listening to your interview with Bob Main on Handgun World. Wow. Now, I don't want to duplicate his excellent interview, so let's focus on two things. You're a graduate of MAG-40, Mossad Ayub's Arm Citizens Rules of Engagement class. Did you find that knowing the law helped you in some way? In the classroom portion of his class, I found two things really, really, really helped. I found the description of what to expect when you're arrested was very accurate. And I wish I would have followed his advice more closely about winning the race to 911. If I would have been the first person to call, the last six months would have been very different for me. I really believe that. If I would have been the first person to call 911, I very much believe that the police would have looked at me as the victim rather than this other person as the victim when they showed up. I believe my story would have been more cogent, more believable. And since we were right at the truck stop, that the police would have went and looked at the video in the truck stop, thereby proving that my story was correct and the other person was lying. So aside from making the 911 call first, what else would you have liked to have done differently? Honestly, the single biggest thing that would have helped me even beyond being the winner to the telephone race would have been a being a member of the armed citizens legal defense network before this thing ever happened. I am a member now. I intend on being a member for the rest of my life. What the ACLDN could have done that they could not do because, well, I am a member now, but I wasn't at the time. So they could not provide financial assistance. I have spent, and I said this on, on Bob's show, and I, I'm, I'm going to say it on every radio show that I'm allowed to be on. I have spent in the tens of thousands of dollars on this. Some of it got recouped by fundraising, but most of that came out of loans from friends. And I used to have a meager retirement account. That's gone. My retirement fund is empty and will be empty until after I pay these loans back. If I would have been a member of ACLDN, they immediately put up a 10 thousand dollar retainer for the attorney which is by the way exactly what my attorney charged as a retainer also they immediately come up with bail money so i wouldn't have had to come up with what ended up being two thousand five hundred dollars in bond that would have been the single thing biggest thing that i if i had done it differently would have made my life today much easier now after listening to bob's interview with you i talked to the wife and we're going to find the money to join aclDN very soon on your recommendation Great. I honestly believe every person who owns a gun needs to be a member. It is $195 for a family to join ACLDN. And what you're going to get is 
and I've got them here, you're going to get a bunch of excellent DVDs that are nearly as good as going to classroom training. They are fantastic. And what's good about these is not only, you know, you go to classroom training, you take notes, you go back to your notes. The DVDs, you just go pop a DVD in and you watch it again and you, and you get more information out of it. You also get a copy of Masada Yu's latest book. And just those things right there are worth the price of admission. Then you get the protection of if you are in a defensive situation and you're arrested, you are immediately connected to help. They've got connections to attorneys in all 50 states. These are pros. These are people that know self-defense law. They know gun law. And they have access to the experts at ACLDN and all the resources of ACLDN. There are other companies out there that do this. And if you don't like ACLDN for some reason, that's fine. Choose one. There's Second Call Defense. There's U.S. Law Shield. There's USCCA. There's a bunch of them out there. The only thing I would recommend, do your homework and make sure you're not getting something where they're going to say, well, look, you pay for it. And then when you get the charges dropped or you get cleared, we'll pay you back. That will do you no good. Make sure whoever you go with will upfront pay for your attorney right now and upfront bail you out of jail right now. Yeah, it was kind of an awkward conversation with the wife. Hey, you know, I'd like to spend this money and this is why. And let me tell you about the story I heard. So everybody else who wants to hear the full story of what happened, I'd like to encourage all of you to listen to episode 381 of Handgun World Podcast, which is another podcast on the Self-Defense Radio Network. All right, Paul, it was good to talk with you, and I'll see you again soon. Truly, it's an honor to be on, and thank you for asking me. To listen to the full interview on Handgun World, search for Handgun World in your handy podcast listening app, or find a link in the show notes where I've included a link to Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. And since the time I talked to Paul Lathrop, I got a chance to listen to another great interview with him on the Safety Solutions Academy podcast, episode 402. Look for a link to that in the show notes or also look it up on iTunes or Stitcher Radio. So speaking of Paul Lathrop, he has invited both of us to appear on his podcast at the Gun Rights Policy Conference. We're going to be streaming live. Wait, wait, wait. I'm going to Gun Rights Policy Conference now? Last anybody heard, I wasn't going because we didn't have any money, Aaron. How did this change? Oh, yeah. Uh, I kind of buried the lead there. So after we recorded the podcast and we mentioned that you could go if someone paid for your ticket and if they did, you'd wear a purple pony shirt. Donations have come in. And so now your plane ticket has been paid for. Yeah, several donations have come in. We've gotten some smaller ones from a few people, but we did get some, wow, a really big donation from Firearms Policy Coalition. So thank you very much, FPC. I will be going to the Gun Rights Policy Conference. Unfortunately, there, um... <laughs> yes, unfortunately, you will be wearing purple pony shirts the entire time. <laughs> oh, God. What did I agree to? You agreed to prance for our amusement, little pony. Oh. So here's what's going on. I actually posted about this on my blog. There's a link in the show notes. So I could just have bought three purple t-shirts for Sean and had done with it. But I had an idea. And that idea is we're going to get him two t-shirts and one purple polo shirt with the pony embroidered on it. And the reason for that is because, well, Sean is known as the man in purple and he wears purple polo shirts when he goes to, uh, you know, gun functions and demonstrations and things like that. And if we make it a purple polo, he may, without paying attention, just pull that out and wear a pony shirt to a demonstration, to a protest where he could be filmed wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> And honestly, because of the way the embroidery works out, there's a minimum. We'd have to get two shirts. And, you know, I'd like one, too, because there is a really nice reception on Friday. And I figure if Sean and I wore semi-matching polo shirts, he'll have his special pony. I'll have the pony sauna that was created for me by the incredibly talented Joey Brown. Then we would be there sort of in uniform and... Well, you know me, I love wearing ponies. So the next time I'm interviewed by like the BBC or whatever, I'll be happy to wear mine. So please, 
donate to the t-shirt fund so that I can get these shirts made for Sean. And you can bet, because we're sharing a hotel room, I will make sure that he's wearing them. And he's going to do interviews in them, and he's going to be filmed in them, and it's going to be a public record that he can never, ever escape from. <laughs> oh, I... There are times I really think, you know, I should have picked Weird to be the co-host because Weird <laughs> wouldn't do this to me. <laughs> yeah, well, you had your chance. Oh, dear. So, yes, I will be in pony shirts. And if you don't want Aaron to have to pay for all the pony shirts herself, there'll be a link in the show notes to Aaron's little fundraiser page. Give her some money, even if I hate the idea. Of, I'm stuck with these shirts anyway. She may as well not go broke buying them. I hate you, Aaron. Yeah, and if you donate, you will have a hand in Sean's embarrassment. And isn't that worth a little money? The sad thing is, is I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who are like, I don't care, I don't care. Oh, wait, Sean gets embarrassed? Oh, yeah, here's some money. (laughs) I hate all of you. I hate you all. Well, that's our show for the week. And remember that the Gunblog Variety Cast is a member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Find the show notes at gunblogvarietycast.com forward slash episode 106. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Gun Blog Variety Cast. Music courtesy of Rob Allen at blog.roballen.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Google Play Music. This podcast is made possible by the Firearms Policy Coalition and by contributions from listeners like you. This is a URS production.